Thank you very much. Well, good morning. Thank you for coming here this morning, by the way. I know that many are cold, but few are, many are cold, but few are frozen. Or as I think it says many are chosen. I don't know what it is, but it's really cold outside, isn't it? And I thank you for being here with us and uh, joining us for our uh, Sunday morning service. A lot of people, I'm sure, said, you know what? I'll watch it online. I'll roll over and I'll listen to it later. But not you, serious students of the Word of God. If it were not for people like you, I wouldn't be here and there would be no class. So thank you. Don't ever think that your attendance does not matter, as you will see this morning. But before we do begin this morning, let's have a nice round of applause for our good friend who's back from the dead, Mr. Mike Beria, stand up there. Mike, there you go. We missed you, buddy. It's good to have you back. You excited? Are you excited? Yes. Good. <laughs> good. Thank you very much, Mike. Good to, good to have you. Mike's here because of the fact that the Word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and the spirit and of the joints and the marrow. The Word of God is a critic of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed. It comes from the breath of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may become spiritually mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Therefore, we are here to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Turn in the word of truth this morning to the book of Numbers, chapter 12. <clears throat> Numbers, the 12th chapter. Jason, thank you very much for filling in. Both of our pastors, Pastor Rick Cabrick and Pastor Rick Batez, they're both uh, in New York today. Uh, Rick's performing his first wedding, as we said last Sunday, and uh, Rick, uh, Pastor Rick Batez, he's just following his wife's orders to go see her mother in New York. So other than that, <laughs> no, they've both uh, t just taken time to uh, fulfill their responsibilities. But isn't it great to be with the royal family this morning? Where else should you be except with God's family? And I thank you for uh, those of you who set your clocks properly. If you're like me, you didn't, I didn't set my clock properly. The uh, television did and the cell phone did. Thank God for those things that keep us in line. Well, Numbers chapter 12, beginning in verse 1, this past week we dealt with the principle of loyalty and why Miriam and Aaron should have been loyal to their brother Moses or to the leader Moses, but they were not. Let's read the, read the context first of what we have. Numbers 12, verse 1. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Notice what they did. They spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman the Egyptian woman that he married, for he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through you, Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? And notice what it says, both Miriam and Aaron, actually Miriam is speaking, she is the leader here. And uh, she says, has the Lord indeed only spoken through you, Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well? That's Miriam and Aaron. And the Lord heard it. Now, the man Moses was very humble, and when I gave you that word for humble this past week, I did not say he was just humble as far as the mental attitude was concerned. He was also humbled. In other words, he had some things that caused him to be not just humble mentally, but humbled experientially because of the fact that he had been rejected by many people. So that you have to pick up that tape. I think that was a Friday evening where we went into the principle of the enforced humility and genuine humility. There's a difference between the two. Uh, enforced humility would be like being humiliated at times where you're forced to be humble. Genuine humility is when you make your own decisions to be so, to do so. So when it says the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth, there's more to it than just Moses being a meek or humble man. But notice what the Bible says in verse 4. And suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam. Notice, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three, and he puts Moses first because he is the leader, you three come out of the tent of meeting. 
So the tent of the meeting, this is where they met in the, uh, they either met in the tabernacle where the tent was or in the temple in the Old Testament. Here, here's the tabernacle and the part of the tabernacle, there's a tent of meeting where they actually met the Lord. Very few people could go inside of that tent. And so the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and Miriam, you three come out to the tent of meeting. So the three of them came out. Now the Lord is about to deal with Moses, Miriam, and Aaron and establish the principle of what we call, listen very carefully, spiritual authority. He's about to lay down the rules of spiritual authority. Why is that important? Well, let's look at why. Verse 5, then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. Notice the Lord is now manifesting himself here in a pillar of cloud during the daytime. He actually appeared as a pillar of cloud in the daytime because you could see that, and then a pillar of fire in the evening. You could see the fire in the sky. So the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud. He stood at the doorway of the tent, and he called Aaron and Miriam. Please notice how, who our Lord is directing the words to. It doesn't say he called Moses Aaron and Miriam, does it? It says he called Aaron and Miriam. Again, notice who he's directing the words uh, to, Miriam and um, Aaron and Miriam. When they had both come forward, he said, now listen, hear, my, hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I the Lord, Jehovah, I shall make myself known to him in a vision. I will speak with him in a dream. That's for the Old Testament prophets. They would have visions and they would have dreams. However, in verse 7, not so when it came to Moses. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him, now notice the indictment here. With Moses, I speak mouth to mouth, even openly, and not in dark sayings. And Moses beholds the form of of the Lord. Notice that phrase. He beholds the form of the Lord. That's what we call a theophanies, which is an Old Testament manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ. So he says, Moses beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? Now, notice that this is what I said, a theophanies. Let me give you a, a difference between what we're about to note. What is a theophanies? A theophanies is an Old Testament manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on in the Old Testament. He appeared as a Theophanes in a form. Sometimes it would be a pillar of cloud. Sometimes it would be the pillar of fire. Sometimes it would be a burning bush. And uh, he would actually appear in different forms. There was a time when he would appear as what we call the angel of Jehovah, the angel of the Lord. When you see that phrase, the angel of the Lord, it doesn't always mean an angel that came from the Lord. Sometimes it is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And there are many passages that teach that the angel of the Lord is God himself. Now that's what we call a theophanies. A theophanies, again, is an Old Testament manifestation of the Lord Jesus Jesus Christ. But then we have what we call a Christophanes. What is a Christophanes? That's a New Testament manifestation of the Lord Jesus Christ after he was resurrected. In fact, once we have the Christophanes, the Lord never appeared to anybody else except he will appear to us as a man. But the difference between a Christophanes and a Theophanes, the Theophanes is an Old Testament manifestation. The Christophanes is when our Lord appeared after he was raised from the dead. Now, notice what it says in verse 9. When the Lord went through all of this, when he said, With him I speak mouth to mouth in verse 8, even openly, and not in dark sayings, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then, he says to Moses, to Aaron and Miriam, why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? And then notice verse 9. So the anger of the Lord, what did the anger of the Lord do? It what? burned against him and then the Lord departed. Why was God angry? I'll tell you why God was angry. God was angry because of one major reason. In fact, the prophet Samuel tells us why. In 1 Samuel 8 verse 7, they had not rejected Moses. So when you reject a man that comes from God, you're not rejecting that man that comes from God. When you reject anyone that comes from God, you're not rejecting them. Ultimately, you are rejecting God himself.
That's why 1 Samuel 8, 7 says, for they have not rejected you, Samuel. The people started to reject Samuel and Samuel got depressed over it. And he began to say, why are people rejecting me? And the Lord said, they have not rejected you, Samuel, but they have rejected who? Me, the Lord says, from being king over them. The point is this, and this is a very important spiritual principle. Don't ever forget it, and I'll show you why when I get, take you to the New Testament. And if you really, I've seen people die the sin unto death that many believe they died the sin unto death. I've seen people get sick. I've seen people get physically sick, mentally sick, and, and have their spiritual life totally uh, destroyed, devoid of the spirit, only uh, simply because they have rejected rejected God's man for their life, or they have rejected a man of God that God has decided to raise up in the days that God is using certain men to actually be representatives of who and what he is. That's why you have to be very careful what you say about any man of God. Here's the point. The point is to speak against a representative, a, a representative authority to speak against someone who represents divine authority incurs divine wrath. When we speak against, I don't care if the man of God is wrong. And I've had two, I know two men of God that were absolutely wrong in my life and they did certain things, but I honored and respected their authority, did not agree with them. But one thing I would, I refuse to do because I saw what happens when you do so, I refuse to speak evil against those that God places in authority. Remember Romans 14, 4, who are you that judges another man's servant? Who are you that judges God's servant to his own master? He stands or falls and stand he will. So to speak against representative authority, that means those that God puts in positions of authority incurs divine wrath. Now think about it. Moses or Aaron and Miriam were the elder brother and sister to Moses. And according to Jewish law, in the home, Moses should be subject to their authority. In other words, in the, in the home, Moses was under the authority of his older brother and his older sister because they were the elders at, at that time. And so Aaron and Miriam were the elder brother and sister to Moses. In the house, Moses had to be subject to their authority. But in the calling and the work of God, they had to subject themselves to, uh, to Moses. Remember what the Lord said, a prophet's not accepted in his own home. Even our Lord had problems with his own family. We saw this past week how even at times in John 7, 5, his own brothers did not believe in him. His mother in Matthew 12 actually thought he, she, he was beside himself. That's the Holy Virgin Mother Mary. And a lot of people don't like me saying that. I, I believe this is still the Lent season, isn't it? And people don't want to hear the fact that even Mary herself thought that there was a time that maybe she had misunderstood what really happened when she became pregnant and maybe thought that something else had happened without her knowledge. She ended up, of course, not following through with that type of attitude. But there was a time when all our Lord's family rejected him. And to reject anyone who's in a position of authority that God has placed there, you are not rejecting that person. You are rejecting God himself. So again, Aaron and Miriam were the elder brother and sister to Moses. In the home, Moses should be subject to their authority. But when it comes to the calling and work of God, they should have been subjecting themselves to Moses. That's why God was angry. Both Miriam and Aaron were not happy with Moses. Why? Well, basically, it was because of jealousy. But they said it was because of the Ethiopian woman whom Moses had married. And that's why they spoke against Moses, because Moses Moses said, don't marry anyone who's an Ethiopian when you're a Jew. Don't marry anyone unless they are, again, unless they are individuals of your own race. Moses said that, and then yet the one who taught that turns around and does the very same thing he told the people not to do. According to what Moses had said, Moses said, don't marry an Ethiopian woman. His older sister Miriam actually should, uh, she should have just accepted it and said, you know what, Moses is in charge and God is the one who has authority over Moses. God placed Moses in that position of authority and I am going to honor Moses because I honor God. But when you don't honor God, when you don't honor the person that God has put in charge, you don't honor God. Let me give you a very subjective illustration. Ladies, 
you are to obey your husbands or submit to your husbands as you do to the who? To the Lord. You don't obey or submit to your husband because he's worthy of it or he deserves it. I mean, some husbands, let's face it, are the first class jerks in all of life. I understand that. I've been a husband myself. I'm sure um, if you asked any of my many, many wives, they would tell you that I was one of the worst individuals of all. But seriously, I want you to think about it. A woman is supposed to submit to the authority because she submits. She's supposed to submit to the authority of her husband because she submits to the authority of the Lord. When she doesn't t submit to that authority, she is not rejecting just her husband. She is rejecting the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. So as an older sister, Miri, uh, Miriam could reprimand her brother on the basis of family problems, but not when it came to the spiritual life. When she opened up her mouth to slander Moses, we're going to read what happened. She touched upon the work of God. Whenever you open up your mouth to slander a man of God or someone who has, God has placed in a position of authority, you are touching upon the work of God, and she would be challenging the position of Moses. That's why spiritual authority is important to understand, and that's what made God very, very angry. That's, what, that's why God was greatly displeased with her, so much so that he's about to do something to her. She could deal with her brother, but she, and she could deal with Moses as a brother, but she could not revile or question God's appointment and uh, the authority that Moses had, because that is to attack God himself. The trouble was neither Aaron nor Miriam recognized God's authority. They did not recognize God's choice and who God's choice really was who would to be leading Israel. Of course, is Moses. Why? Well, they entered into what uh, Psalm 19, 13, David said to keep him from. He said, keep me from the great transgression. And he said, what is the great transgression? Presumptuous sins. We presume something to be true and it's not. And then he goes on in the same psalm and he talks about keep me away from familiarity. Don't let me become familiar with God's people. Be very careful when you stop becoming familiar with individuals in your life that you're closely related to, but God has appointed to them to positions of authority. Whether it's your father, whether it's your mother, whether it's your, your, your elder brother or your younger brother, no matter who it may be, be careful how you handle the authority of God. So Moses did not answer back, by the way. Moses knew this. He know, Moses knew that it was was God who had chosen Moses to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Nevertheless, even though it was God, Miriam despised Moses. And he knew that God is the one who actually would come through for him, but Miriam despised Moses. Why? Because she did not like the appointment of God at all. And for that, that's what made God very, very angry because of the fact that Miriam was attacking the divine authority of God. Moses knew that he, if he had been set up by God to be the authority, he did not need to defend himself. Whenever you're set up by God and, and you have a position of authority like a pastor does, you don't have to defend yourself. You know why? Isaiah 54, 17 says, no weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. If you have any authority whatsoever, no matter where that authority may be, in the spiritual realm or even in the natural realm as the employer, over the employees. The Bible says there's a natural law. No weapon that's formed against you is going to prosper. Whoever reviled Moses didn't really touch Moses. They touched death because God was about to give Moses a protection. As long as God gave him authority, all Moses had to do was remain, uh, remain silent. One writer says a lion needs no protection. If you're in a line, you don't need no protection. And uh, you have authority from God. And if you have authority from God in any realm, you don't need protection in that area. Moses was able to represent God in authority because he had been first subject to God's authority himself. The authority which Moses represented was God, God's own. And God says, I'm going to give my authority to a man. And that man is going to lead my people, Israel, through the promise to the promised land. And if anyone touches him, they touch me. Now, is this a true principle in the New Testament? Well, let's go forward now to 1 Timothy chapter 5. 
First Timothy, the fifth chapter. <clears throat> this is what the Apostle Paul said, and let me show you this principle in the New Testament. Remember, for those of you who don't recognize, you know, people say, well, you need to teach more, Pastor. Well, let me ask you a question. How many of you have studied every verse in First Timothy? Because I taught every verse in First Timothy. So before I need to teach more, how about you catching up to what I've already taught? And we already studied every verse, every single verse in First Timothy chapter, uh, in First Timothy, all six chapters. And let me show you this principle in First Timothy chapter five, when we studied every verse from the original language, which actually says certain things in the Greek. I'm gonna show you the English first, and then give you what we saw it says in the original language of the Greek. Notice verse 17. It says, let the elders, oh, that's a word, by the way, that has to do with the, the, uh, the pastor teacher, one of the titles for a pastor teacher, just like presbyteros and episcopalian is a title for, the, episkopos is a title for the pastor teacher. So Paul is dealing with the pastor teachers. He says, let the elders or the pastors who ru rule well be considered worthy of what kind of honor? Double honor, especially, now this is why we know it's the pastor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. Now, when we study this from the original language, we noted the corrected translation. Here it is. Those pastor teachers who have ruled well with the result that they keep ruling honorably, that's the present tense of the verbs in the chapter, they must be considered worthy of what kind of honor? Double honor. Most of all, it goes on to say, those who work hard to the point of exhaustion. Never feel sorry for your pastor if he gets exhausted studying. I was up, that's some of the people I've emailed to. How many times do I email you letters, uh, Jason? What time in the morning? 2.30. 2.30, what other time? Uh, three, three four, five, you see? Yeah. Ask them. I'm up a lot during that time. Why? I love to study, number one. Number two, I'm to study to the point of exhaustion. That's my job. So I never, never feel sorry for a pastor that does that. But here's the corrected translation. Those that receive double honor should be honored. The pastor should be honored. But most of all, those who work hard to the point of exhaustion in the study of the word and the teaching of Bible doctrine. Then in the New American Standard, by the way, if you have a Bible and you want to know what translation I believe is the best and the, what is the closest to the original language, it would be an NAS, a New American Standard. And most of you have that, and I hope that you do, because look at 1 Timothy 5.18 now. It says, for the scripture says, he's, this is why the pastor is to, is to receive double honor. I don't even want to tell you what the honor is all about. You can figure that out for yourself with the next verse. The scripture says, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. In other words, when the ox is working, don't stop him from doing so where he has to get distracted to do other things to actually supply for himself. Because the laborer is worthy of his what? Wages. I think you know what he's talking about here. Let me give you the entire verse from the Greek again. I'm going to show you this has to do with spiritual authority. Very important principle coming up. For the scripture says, Quotation from Deuteronomy 25.4, you shall not muzzle the bull while he is threshing. Also, in Deuteronomy 24.15, the laborer is worthy of his wages. Then you have, now here's the two important verses right now. Look at verses 19 and 20. Do not receive an, what's the next word? Don't receive an accusation against an elder, a pastor. Someone says, I want to tell you about your pastor's sin. I want to tell you what your pastor's doing wrong. And by the way, when you attack the authority, you're not only attacking the pastor, you're attacking the Lord. And Satan's goal is to get you to question the authority so that when the authority gives you the word of God, you say, I don't really believe that because he fails. Well, of course I fail. Doesn't the Bible say all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Well, why get shocked when you hear, well, your pastor sins. What kind of sins? Some of you get shocked because your list of sins has to do with immoral, overt sins. God's worst ones have to do with three, having to do with the way you think, three having to do with how you speak, and one having to do with the overt one called murder. But here's what it says. Do not receive an accusation against the pastor, an elder, except on the basis of two or three 
witnesses, eyewitnesses, by the way. These are not two or three people who say, well, I heard he did this. I heard she did that. That's not a witness. Two or three witnesses means they have to observe the act. So you have to have three witnesses that are observing what the pastor or the leader is being accused of. Then it says this, those, and by the way, those here, as J. Vernon McGee brings out, Colonel Arby Thien Jr. brings out, and many other good Bible teachers, those refer to the ones who receive accusations, not the pastor. It says those who receive the accusations, I could give you the Greek, but I'll give it to you in a moment, who continue in sin, the sin of receiving accusations, rebuke in the presence of who? All. That means before the congregation, you should rebuke anyone. You should rebuke someone who's sown discord in the congregation, who's trying to discredit the man behind the pulpit, because it's not the man, it's the what? It's the message. And Satan's goal is if you can question the man, you're eventually going to question the message, and he's got us. Because there's only one mind smarter than his, and here it is, the mind of Jesus Christ. Amen? Discredit that mind, you have you've have a way of destroying the local assembly. So when it says, do not receive an accusation against an elder, except on the basis of two or three witnesses, those who receive the accusations, who continue in that sin, rebuke in the presence of all, so that the rest, oh, that means the rest who are thinking about receiving the accusations, also may be what? Fearful of sinning. Now let me give you the Greek here. And by the way, this is all documented for you. Pick up a CD or go online. You can study this. The Bible says in verse 19, against the pastor teacher, do not receive an accusation. Against the pastor teacher, except on the basis of two or three witnesses, eyewitnesses, that is. Verse 20, those who continue in the sin of receiving or making accusations against the pastor, reprimand in the presence of all in order that the rest of the congregation also may have respect, not fear, but respect is what the word of God says. The point is, like everything else in life, you need authority. You need to respect authority. Authority is your friend. If you don't have authority and respect authority, you have chaos. It inevitably will result. Authority is your friend. Just like the cold is your friend. I love the cold. You know why? There are two basic reasons why I love the cold. Number one, it kills germs. They do, it really does. Why do you think when people go to the hospital, they come out sicker? Because the hospitals are so damn hot with the heat, they keep the germs alive and you pick up other people's germs. And then secondly, they kill bugs. And I love anything that can kill a fly. So I love the cold. They can kill, they can, they can actually kill germs and kill, cold. they can kill uh, bugs. But you see, we don't like it, but is it good for us? Absolutely. And so what made God angry was the fact that those who were under the authority discredited those who had authority over them, namely Moses. And because they received that accusation, God says, I've got to deal with that. And if you don't believe this, go to Hebrews. Go back, go forward to Hebrews chapter 13. When it comes to spiritual authority, just let me give you a few, uh, a few passages before we get back. Because I want to give you something great this morning. I still have a lot of time. Since where else is there to go but a nice warm building? Isn't it nice in here? I don't know about you, but I feel nice. I got my new sweater on. Someone says, wow, it's the first time I haven't worn black, I think, in five years. So I'm not in mourning. I'm happy. Someone, of course, Suzanne complimented me. She goes, you look like a referee. <laughs> Thanks, Suzanne. And then Robert goes, no, a zebra. So anyway... <laughs> But anyway, it's good. isn't it good to be alive? Come on now. Isn't it good to be alive? Isn't it good to have a new person? You know that Bob and, and Sandra have come to our local assembly and they've done in three months what a lot of people haven't done in three years. And she got up here, she does a great job this morning singing, writing the song. Come on. You know, God does provide Jehovah Jireh, doesn't he? He provides. And don't forget that. He will keep on providing. And don't ever underestimate yourself. He might be using you. He might be using you again. You don't know. Just sit back, relax, wait for the timing of God. Now, when it comes to spiritual authority, notice what made God angry, but when it comes to, was the rejection of that. But when it comes to spiritual authority, look at Hebrews 13, 7. Notice the word here. It says, remember, the first word says, what's the first word? Remember those who led you. Now, what kind of individuals is he talking about? President, the president? No. Your teachers? No. 
those who spoke the what to you? The word of God to you. So we're talking about pastors. We're talking about those who teach. Remember those who led you who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the result of their conduct and imitate their faith, their doctrine. Look at verse 17. Obey your what? Obey your leaders. There's respect for authority. That's what Miriam and Aaron's not doing. Miriam, you know, is about to get leprosy for seven days. And if we're not for her brother Moses, her little brother Moses, who went and interceded for her because he had compassion for her, she would have died in leprosy. But we'll see how that's going to work out if we get that far this morning. Hebrews 13, 17 says, obey your leaders. And what are you to do? Submit what? Submit to them. Verse 17 of Hebrews 13. Why? They keep watch over your souls. I've got to give an account for every one of you who have been assigned to me. I told you the Bible teaches in Acts 20, 28 and in 1 Peter 5, 3. I have been assigned to a group of people, and a group of people have been assigned to me. Those who have been assigned to me, I've got to give an account over your soul. I've got to watch your soul. I've got to answer to God for what I taught you, what I gave you, how I lived my life, and how I revealed the nature of Christ. I'll be evaluated based upon that. And I'll receive double honor, amen? But I also receive double judgment. I don't hear any amen for that one. James 3.1 says, don't be many leaders. You're going to be under double judgment. Yeah, you get double honor, but you're also going to get double judgment. Verse 17, obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an, or what? An account. Let them do this with joy, happiness, and not with grief. For it's, this, would be, this would be unprofitable for you. If a pastor has to deal with you, and he has to do it with uh, grief, it's not going to be profitable for you. If he, he wants to be happy. He wants to say, what a great thing it was to have you as a member of his congregation because you brought peace and blessing. You brought truth. You brought honor. That's something that can never, ever be overlooked. And by the way, when Hebrews 13, 7 says, remember those who speak to you the word of God, let me show you what one writer actually, well, two writers actually say, how do you remember those who speak to you the word of God? We're in the book of Hebrews. Go back to Hebrews 10, verse 24. Here's how you remember those who spoke to you the word of God. You, you, those who speak to you the word of God will actually be manifested by Hebrews 10, 24 through 26, where the writer says, And let us consider how to stimulate one another to what? To love and good deeds. Let us build up one another, to stimulate one another, get each other stimulated to love, impersonal love, and to good deeds. How? How do you remember? Not what? Not forsaking your own assembling together. Jim, can you watch just in case? Mike, just in case something. Not forsaking your own assembling together, as is the habit of some. How do, you, for how do you remember those who speak to you the word of God? How do you remember your local assembly? Well, you build up one another, stimulate one another with love and good deeds. And then in verse 25, you remember them by not forsaking your own assembling together. I give you a hand clap for those of you who came this morning as your pastor. Thank you. No, I'm giving you the hand clap. Oh, let me make it good. <sighs> Yeah, no, I think this is what happens when you wear shirts like this, I guess. <laughs> Not forsaking your own assembling together, as is the habit of some. Notice it says, when people forsake assembling for de together, it's the habit of some. The majority of born-again believers are not in church today, trust me. As is the habit of some, but gathering together for a purpose of encouraging one another and do it all the more as you see the day drawing near. What is the day drawing near? The day when he's coming back. Because if we go on sinning in context, willfully, in context, he's talking about assemb uh, forsaking, assembling together with other believers. It says to be sinning willfully when you don't do it. After receiving the knowledge of the truth, there remains no longer a sacrifice for sin. In other words, there's nothing you can do, no sacrifice you can offer to make up, your, to make up for your disobedience to gather together. There's nothing you can do except one thing. What is it? Rebound, not enough, and recover. 
get back in church, get your butt back in church. And either face to face or non face to face, but that's how you do it. Now all that tells us why it's important to have spiritual authority. Because if you don't have it, it's going to hurt you, to hurt the local assembly, and inevitably our Lord will not be glorified. Now go back to Numbers chapter 12. Let's wrap up this passage in verse 9. Numbers 12, verse 9. <clears throat> Boy, you know, I was thinking today, this happens all the time, but right before service I was saying, it's going to be a good message this one, a really good one. And you know why? One of the experiences I have had throughout my lifetime is when, when it's hard for people to get to the local assembly or there's all kinds of distractions to stop us from gathering together, that's when God pours out his spirit greater than what he's done like maybe the last year. He'll always give you something special. You say, why? Because Hebrews 11:6 6 says, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek for him. And one of the rewards you're getting this morning is a doctrinal message that's probably so important to your life you won't realize it until you have to go through it or you recognize what it was that you heard. And I'm the same way. I won't realize it until I realize what it was that I really taught. But some of the greatest messages you'll ever hear are when you have the lowest crowds. Why? Because Satan wants to do whatever he can to try to stop people from hearing messages that can change their lives. So, verse 12, what happened when they rejected the spiritual authority? The anger of the Lord burned, what? Against two, them, both Moses, both uh, Miriam and Aaron. You might wonder, why didn't Aaron get leprosy? Because Aaron was the mouse. He was the wimp. He was the follower. He wasn't the one in charge, though he should have been. But look at verse 10. When the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous. After the Lord left, all of a sudden, Miriam, Miriam standing there, she's leprous, as white as snow. As Aaron turned toward Miriam, behold, she was less leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord. Notice what Aaron's now saying. He's going to Moses, his younger brother now. He said he calls Moses his Lord, not, not as, as Savior, but the ruler. He's, he's honoring his authority now. Aaron said to Moses, oh, my Lord, I beg you. Do not account this sin to, uh, to us, in which we have acted foolishly by rejecting your authority, in which we have sinned. Do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten. That's what leprosy does. It eats away your flesh. Away when it, her flesh has been half eaten away when it comes from his mother's womb. Don't let it be like that. And then in beginning in verse 13, I want you to notice the compassion of Moses. Moses cried out to the Lord saying, now notice what Moses did. He didn't say, yes, gotcha. You deserve what you got. It's about time. I told you, you're going to reap what you sow. You've got to pay, pay, pay. How long do you remember you hear me say that for years? You haven't heard that in a while. That's what people want. You've got to pay. You've got to pay for your sin. You've got to pay for your mistakes. It's about time you, you get what you deserve. No, Moses cried out to the Lord saying, oh God, what? Heal her. I pray. She's despised me. She's attacked me. She's rejected my authority. My compassion makes me ask you, heal her, I pray. And in verse 14 and 15, we see Miriam, seven days of solitary confinement or discipline. She's not going to die. The Lord said to Moses, if her father had but spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? In other words, there's going to be something for her rejection. I just can't overlook uh, when people just commit certain negative decisions and say, I'm not going to let them reap the consequences of what I said they would reap if they enter into that uh, form of trash. So yes, she's going to go through something. And that was the custom of their day, day to go through something for seven days. Then the Lord goes on to say, let her be shut. I mean, he goes on, let, the Lord says, let her be shut up for seven days outside the camp. Get her away from the Jews because it's, it's catchy. You can catch leprosy. It has, that's why they had to be quarantined. And afterward, she may be received again after seven days. Therefore, Miriam received from Moses the discipline of a person whose father had spit in her face. But you know what? It was grace all the way, wasn't it? Only seven days when she could have died. 
She had a lot more coming to her if Moses had not given her that prayer. She had a discipline that she would have ended up dying of leprosy in. So Miriam, verse 15, was shut up outside the camp for seven days, and the people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Notice that. Instead of being a leader over Israel, then Miriam is now isolated from Israel for seven days and in the state of leprosy. Remember, she was a prophetess. She was a leader to the females. Not above Moses, but she was a leader to the females. And instead of being a leader over Israel, she's now isolated for, from Israel for seven days in a state of leprosy. And the people had to wait for seven days so that Miriam could reflect, as well as the people, they could reflect upon the terrible evils of maligning, judging, gossiping, slandering those in positions of spiritual authority. You see, not only does it take spiritual power to execute God's plan, it also takes spiritual power not to gossip, not to slander, not to malign. Yeah, I need spiritual power. I have to execute the plan of God. I also need spiritual power so I don't get stupid enough to gossip and slander and malign. Not just those, in, those who are in positions of authority, but any born-again believer. The Bible says in Titus, I think it's Titus 3, it says, speak evil of no one, no one. So though this applies to leaders especially, it also applies to how we treat other people. In other words, the same spiritual power that provides Christian integrity for all of us also provides the power to resist both the arrogant and the emotional complex of sins. The Jews had resisted the doctrinal teachings of Moses. That resulted in the fact that they lacked spiritual power, and therefore they spent their lives complaining and murmuring. However, remember the attitude of Moses. He was a spiritually mature believer, and there's one word that describes his attitude. It is the word compassion. I told you I was going to teach on the doctrine of compassion this Sunday. Well, so much for that. It's already 11 o'clock. But we will begin some of the principles. Moses was humble, and he was also compassionate. For we read in verse 13, he cried out to the Lord saying, Oh, Lord, oh God, heal her, I pray. He was not only a humble and meek individual, but he was a compassionate individual as well. Now turn in your Bibles to the last book in the Bible, which is the book of Revelation, and then go to the book before that, the book of Jude. It's a nice way of getting to Jude. <laughs> Jude 1. Though there's only one chapter, so you don't have to say Jude 1, but there is only one chapter. But let me show you what Jude, Jude said. Jude is the last book before Revelation. In Jude one twenty one. And many people believe that this was, Jude was one of the half-brothers of our Lord. Half-brother because his father was not God the Father. Well, his father was not God the Father. His father was probably Joseph. But it says in verse 21, Keep yourselves in the love of God. Oh, boy, what a command. Always keep yourselves in what? The love of God. Be careful. It's so easy to lose love, isn't it? Just like it's so easy to lose compassion and being tender and merciful. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy, the compassion of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy, mercy means compassion, by the way. Have mercy or compassion on some who are what? Doubting. You see someone who's going through situations right now and they're doubting? A little compassion never hurts. <laughs> then it says, save others. This is not just salvation. It also means deliver by snatching them out of the fire. They're about to be burned either experientially in time or they're not saved. They will, for they will be burned in the eternal state. But it says save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy, again compassion, with fear, even he hating the garment that's polluted by their flesh. Oh, to him who's able to keep you from stumbling, to make you stand in the presence of his glory, with bl blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now and forever. Amen. What a passage. Keep yourselves in the love of God. 
having mercy, having mercy, having compassion, saving others, delivering others because of your compassion. There are many people today who are looking for answers to life, aren't there? All of us have people that we work with, we love, family members, looking for answers. We live in times of tremendous opportunity for God's people. You know why? Because people are looking for love. They're looking for compassion. They're looking for someone who cares. There have been remarkable technological advances in science, in medicine, in communication, on the internet. All of them are designed to improve our life. However, in spite of all of these fantastic, uh, all of these fantastic improvements in life, people still have needs, such little needs as it's not good for man to be alone. People need people. People, <laughs> so people need people, don't they? You might think that you don't, but you do. A weak person is someone who doesn't think they need compassion. A strong person is someone that knows that they do. There are countless cases of loneliness and depression among born-again believers. And in most of these situations, people resort to what we call sublimation. Fill your time with something that can answer your problems. An attempt to fill their emptiness with such things as alcohol, drugs, sex, hobbies, money, etc. Materialism. Family, like, like the, uh, the book I've written on the, the eight experiments of men. I don't understand why people haven't read that yet. We still have a lot of those books that are uh, still ready to, to go out. It's one of the best books you could ever have that gives you answers to life, not only for yourself, but for your family members, for your loved ones, and for others. The Eight Experiments of Men, a dissertation on the book of Ecclesiastes. And so people are searching for something that will change them. It has been said this, it's been said that sympathy is feeling sorry for someone. Empathy is feeling what he's going through. But compassion is doing something about his need. Oh yeah, we can all have sympathy. I feel sorry for that person. But feeling sorry is not enough. Empathy, I, I feel what they're going through. But compassion, I'm going to do something about their need. In other words, the Word of God teaches this even in the King, Trans King James translation. Here's what the King James translation says. I love it. In Jude 1.22, it says, And of some have compassion, making a what? A difference. You'd be surprised how a little bit of compassion on our part as ambassadors for Christ makes a difference. What about if they're going to reject us? The Bible says when Jesus was on a mountain and he was looking at Jerusalem in uh, Luke 19.35, it said he had compassion on the city and it said two words, Jesus wept. And he wept over a city and over a people that he knew were going to reject him for he came into his own, his own received him not. Compassion makes a difference. And in reality, many of you don't realize how much of, of the ability you have to make someone's life change, to change someone's life by the way that you live, the things that you say, your actions. As you minister the word of God with the love of God, speaking the truth in love, many people will be touched, challenged, and changed by the words that you say. Do you realize the power that you have right here in your mouth? Go back to Proverbs 18. You got 10 minutes, so bear with me. By the way, my clock says 10.07. They haven't, they haven't put that one back, so we're going to have to go buy that one. It's only 10.08 right now. Too bad. Proverbs 18.21. Let me show you the power that we all possess. Maybe you'll use this before the day is over. Some of you will use it in the negative realm, I'm sure. Probably even on your way home. But some can use it in the, power, the positive, powerful one. Proverbs 18.1 says, Death and life. Say it with me, what? Yeah. Death and what? Life. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Say it with me, the whole thing. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. One more time. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. The next time someone opens up their mouth and says, about to say something negative, just look at them, stop them right in their tracks and say, Proverbs 18, 21. I forgot. 
Death and life are in the power of the tongue. That means the words that we say can produce death in someone's life or they can produce life in someone's life. Remember that when Adam was first created, he stood alone and without someone to share his experience in the Garden of Eden. Can you imagine being Adam and you waking up and there's no one, no member of the human race there, but there's lions and tigers and bears and there's beautiful nature, there's trees, all kinds of beautiful trees, there's uh, the, the beautiful uh, principle of uh, the moon and the stars, and, and all of a sudden you see the waters and you see the animal kingdom, and uh, he could eat of every tree except one, and there were hundreds of trees in the garden. He just couldn't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. His eyes had beheld the beautiful creation of God. The animals were no threat to Adam because the fall had not taken place. They were, they were all tame as they were throughout the garden before the fall but there was no one that could feel what he felt he was alone no one to laugh or rejoice with him and say to it say to each other isn't the lord fantastic so much so that the lord intervened and he said in genesis 2 verse 18 the lord god says it is not good for the man to be what alone i will make him a helper an easer suitable for him. What is a helper? The Hebrew word is ezer, E-Z-E-R. It's translated helper. It means to surround someone with care. The Lord said, I'm going to make someone that's going to surround the person with care. Adam surrounded the woman. Before their fall, Adam surrounded the woman with care. Not Eve. Eve was not born. Eve was not Eve until after she had kids in Genesis 3.20. That's when she became Eve, the mother of all living. But she was known as Eshaw. Adam was known as Ish, Ish and Ishor, and they surrounded each other with care. One of the great definitions of, by the way, the word compassion. So many people today experience the same feelings that Adam did long ago. They are alone, and there seems to be no one to understand what they're going through. No one who has compassion. They long for someone who cares. Again, Jude one twenty two. That's why the Bible says some have compassion making a difference. And this is only our introduction. This means that tenderness and compassion can change lives. And ultimately, we know what these people need. In fact, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and let, let's look at verse 20. This will be my, I've got one more passage after this, and we'll be through. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 20. What is it that people ultimately need? Let's face it, we know what they need. They need a relationship with God, amen? So ultimately, that's the first most important thing, a relationship with God. That's why every one of us are called something. We are called ambassadors. An ambassador is someone that represents a country to a far, in a foreign country. The foreign country is the world. The country that we represent is heaven because we are from above. We're called ambassadors. Why? Because we're called ambassadors for Christ because we represent him to these people in life. 2 Corinthians 5.20. If we are ambassadors for Christ, we represent Christ on this earth. Christ was compassionate, therefore we should be what? Compassionate. As though God were entreating through us, begging you through us, he says, we beg you on behalf of Christ, come back to God, be reconciled to God. A Christian can have an intellectual understanding of the Bible. Knowledge is important, as Hebrews 4, 6 through, uh, Hebrews 4, 6, 8 says, my people, however, are destroyed because they lack what? They lack knowledge. But the Bible says that tenderness and compassion can make a difference in a person's life. And here's the passage I want to close with that can remind you of how important it is of how we treat one another because as we treat one another, so we treat our Lord. Go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Look at verse 9. Remember what Solomon taught us. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, right after the book of Psalms, after the book of Proverbs. It says in verse 9, I'm hearing those pages go rip, but let them rip. Because I want you to see it in your eye gate, let it go through your ear gate. It says in verse 9, two are better than what? One. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if either of them falls, and of course we all will, the one will lift up his companion. 
One falls, the one who did not lifts up the one who fell, and vice versa. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. There's not another to be compassionate to. There's not another to love them through it. There's not another to make a difference in what they're facing. If either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there's not another to lift him up. Furthermore, if two lie down together, they keep warm. But how can they be warm alone, you see? You can't be warm alone unless you've got an electric blanket. I know you can add things and say, wow, that's not true, Bob. We're talking spirituality here, right? If two lie down together, they keep warm, but how can one be warm alone? And if one can overpower him who is alone, two can what? Resist him. Someone comes after your friend, comes after your husband, comes after your wife, comes after your pastor, comes after your children, comes after anybody that you love. They come after you, they come after me. They come after me, they come after you, you see? In other words, when people are, have a relationship where they care about each other, they're not alone when they go through certain things. If one can overpower him who is alone, two can resist him. And then look at this. This is where the fellowship of the body of Christ comes in in the church age. A cord of three strands is not quickly torn apart. Did you ever see a rope being made where they'll have actually a thread and they'll just have a piece of thread, and then they'll get a second piece of thread, and they'll wrap it around the first piece. Then they'll get the third piece of thread, and they'll wrap it around the first two. And that rope gets stronger and stronger. The more pieces of thread wrap around each other, the stronger that little thread becomes a strong, strong rope. That's what happens when God's people gather together. They have compassion. They respect the authority of God. They don't attack the authority of God and they respect the authority of one another. For divine institution number one says you have a free will. My job is to honor your free will and vice versa. That's what will change people's lives. Compassion will make a difference and that's what God got so angry because he knew the Jews were about to get into so much trouble because they forgot what it meant to honor the authority of God. Be not deceived, God's not mocked, whatever they sow, they shall also what? Reap. But thank God it's greater is he that's in us than he that is in the world. Let us pray. Father, thank you on this cold day that we have been warm, warmed up by the word of God, which is alive and powerful. As Jeremiah said, your word has been like a fire within us. Challenge us with the information that we've learned this morning. And Father, let us see the importance of respecting spiritual authority and the importance of having the compassion needed to grow in your grace and knowledge. Challenge us with all the information we've learned and if there's anyone who's been born again and saved, I wanna tell you if you've never believed in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, now's your time to do so. You can tell God right now, forming the sentences in thought only, that you're willing to believe upon Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. For believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. So thank you, Father, for this privilege that you've given us. If anyone has offered up that faith, let them say, see that they've just joined the fantastic body of Christ, the church that will reign forever and ever, and bless the remainder of our service. For we ask it in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, based upon his merits, we love him so as we love you through the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. Thank you.